Drew Cleveland graduated from Gordon in 2017 with a bachelor's degree in theater arts and creative writing and has since been working in the Boston area as an actor and historical interpreter. He loves exploring the many uses and forms of language, especially in the art of theater. In his spare time, he can be found reading scripture, exercising, watching films, making playlists, and writing. The time Drew spent at Gordon was influential not only to his faith, but to his artistic philosophy. He is grateful for being invited to join Barrington's Digital Fine Arts Festival. And now I'll turn things over to Drew to get us started. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Gardner and uh, Ryan for helping me to uh, get involved with this. Um, it's a great, a great honor. Um, I don't have, oh, and great, we have Julia and Olivia here now too. So we have both of uh, our, our castmates here. Um, so yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't have I don't have much to say in terms of um, starting out. I when I I Ryan invited me to um, get involved uh, to do something for this festival, which I think is a great idea, and we have to be uh, we have to be doing everything we can right now to uh, persevere in the arts. I think <laughs> even if it doesn't um, earn us money, but it barely did that in the first place anyway, so it's not a great loss. Um, so yeah, uh, Ryan invited me to get involved with this uh, festival and um, we kind of came down to two ideas um, and Ryan and I talked about it for a while on the phone and it was between kind of what, it, what, what, it, what this ended up being, uh, a Shakespeare reading with some kind of uh, exegesis, if you will, um, of the relevant themes. Uh, but also um, when I'm not doing theater, I am a historical interpreter on the Freedom Trail, so I uh, study a lot of um, colonial American history um, for my job. So there was that, so was, there was the Shakespeare option, but the other thing that we came up with was possibly some sort of hybrid lecture thing on, uh, you know, the, uh, how historical interpretation and giving tours and doing speeches like that can tie into um, environmental theater and how uh, the skills that I learned in, in uh, the theater department helped me to um, learn how to put together my own material and learn how to adapt the text to whatever situation I was in, um, giving 90 minute tours a day. Um, but ultimately, um, I didn't do that, <laughs> um, although I could have. Uh, I decided that my heart was really set on Shakespeare, um, and I felt like there was perhaps a little bit more to be um, uh, connected to uh, uh, the present day and the things that are going on um, in the country and in the world right now. Um, and so that's kind of where I felt like my heart was leading me. So I got um, two fantastic uh, actresses to join me. Um, yes, a round of applause for Julia and Olivia. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to think, was there, any, was there anything else that you wanted to hear about, Ryan? Yeah, did you just want to talk a little bit just about how you first got into theater and just, yeah, when, when that was and just sort of leading up to your time at Gordon, what led you to Gordon? Just touch on that a little bit. Yeah, um, I guess what I, I first started doing theater when I was in middle school um, and I only did it, I'm not the only reason, but the one of the main reasons I did it because, was because I was a new kid uh, in town and uh, we had just moved. Um, my lovely parents are here as well, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> um, but we, we had just moved and I had befriended uh, uh, a, a, a young, a kid that was also um, still a very good friend of mine um, who is in Portland now. Um, and he was very much involved with local community theater there. And I was looking for an outlet to um, kind of feel engaged and connected as well. And um, I kind of latched onto him and uh, found that it was very much an outlet for me um, to explore parts of myself that maybe I didn't realize needed exploring. Um, 
And uh, so I very quickly found that doing theater, even as, you know, however old I was, 12 or 13 at the time, and continuing to do it through high school and then eventually into college, really helped me discover um, the ways in which I could express who I was uh, that I couldn't necessarily in everyday life. And if you know me, you know that I am a fairly reserved person. <laughs> um, I'm uh, not overly expressive uh, off stage, um, but that's why I think acting on stage was so much of a release for me um, and uh, gave me the things that I needed to kind of, uh, I guess gave me this sort of emotional and mental sustenance that I needed to um, latch onto and feed myself. Um, and the more I became attached to it, the more I grew in it, and the more I discovered more of myself as I did it. And so it was uh, kind of like, it was kind of the gift that um, keeps on giving in a way, and it still is. And now I can do great things like this with excellent actresses and actors and um, continue to feel ever more uh, rewarded by it. Yeah. Nice, great. Um, then another question I had is, uh, what relevance do you think these characters have in the present day that we saw tonight? And how do you feel you can relate to them? And Olivia and Julia, feel free to jump in too on how you uh, can relate and how you think they um, have relevance in the present day. Yeah, I, I actually feel like since Julia and Olivia were the ones that were actually performing the roles, I feel like they might actually be even more equipped <laughs> To, yeah, uh, definitely. to talk about it. But if you guys have anything to say, I'm, I'm more than welcome. I'm going to take a sip real quick. <laughs> I think um, when you asked that question, the first thing that came to my mind was in Much Ado About Nothing, Drew and Julia and I, we talked a lot about that specific scene with Benedict and Beatrice, how it's just so applicable to life, how you know, they're proclaiming their love, but it's in such a weird way, and it's just not the right timing, and it's a little awkward, and it's just, it's not perfect, you know, and I just think that that part is really relatable, and it was um, refreshing to do that scene, and just really depicts life well, and yeah, just like a very um, authentic part of life, you know, that we all could relate to. It is kind of the, the the predominant tone of the scene is now's not a very good time. I think <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's there's kind of a lot going on in the background. Um, it's kind of an inopportune time to confess um, each other's love. But um, that's all, and that's that, I think that's for me one of the main things that I love about that particular scene is that there's there's just so much. Um, there's just so much going on, and uh, that's partly why it feeds into this really beautiful kind of comedic energy that we explored a lot how um, uh, Beatrice and Benedict, uh, you know, what would happen if they're confessing their love for each other, but they're not actually doing it lovingly, um, because there's all this other baggage that they're bringing into the scene. Um, but anyway, I'm ranting now. Um, I want to hear what you have to say, Julia. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I think similarly to um, and as you like it, just like the idea of like how to love someone and this girl is like trying to teach him like how to actually love someone and they're both so young. I think it's so relatable. Like what is love? Like how do we do it? It's just so relatable and like like teaching other people how to love you. I feel like everyone does that at some point. <laughs> and it's a very like unconventional way of teaching, you know, dressing up as a boy, but I think we do it today too. Like you gotta do it this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think, I haven't actually thought about this myself because I didn't actually have to perform any of the parts. Um, I can tell you though that when I was uh, a while ago, when I, 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 I played Orlando, a couple of years ago in, as you like, um, in a, a regional production. And uh, I can tell you that I, I do not, I, I have difficulty um, 
getting into the character of Orlando. Um, he's not exactly my style. Um, I, I have difficulty playing the young ingenue. Um, but, uh, in, <laughs> and for those of you who know me, you will know that to be true. But, um, but yeah, I'm trying to think. I, 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 you know, I particularly feel like if I had to choose any of the characters that we heard today, um, I, I, you know, I, I resonate a lot with, I think I resonate a lot with both Cassius and Brutus, honestly. Um, I love the conflict that they have with each other because I feel like it, in many ways kind of represents two sides of one person um, and how we see in Cassius this man who, and I won't go too in depth here, but I, you know, what I love about Cassius is that he may be prideful, but he does, he recognizes the wrong that's happening in, in Rome and uh, how it's getting out of control um, and wants to do something about it. Perhaps, you know, albeit uh, brashly, but he's passionate about what he, what he believes in. Um, whereas Brutus may, you know, may or may not feel the same way, but he also feels differently about it in that, and this is what I was saying in the, um, in the uh, performance as well, that uh, Brutus is torn between the love of his country and the love of its leader. And um, that can sometimes be, uh, I think we find our allegiance is sometimes being pulled in different directions. and. The complexity of truth and how things are rarely black and white and it seems ever more that way now I think um, but so you know Cassius and Brutus I think kind of represent two sides of the same coin where they both recognize you know it's somebody who recognizes the, the injustice and the wrong that's happening in the world but also somebody who, who's also caught up in their own internal struggles about it at the same time and not sure what to do and is stuck in uh, a sort of cyclical mindset. Yeah, I, I, I relate to both of them in that way. I feel like that scene too is just so like relevant, like right now. I remember when we were like kind of going through it, it's like, wow, like I've literally had these conversations like a day ago, just like using different words, you know? And like, like you said, like both characters are relatable. Like I find that too, like in some moments you feel like Cassius, some moments you feel like Brutus as you're just trying to like navigate the world there's because just so much has happened yeah we we did we, we discussed a little bit uh and i won't go into much detail here but we did discuss a little bit what some of the um uh you know impulses or inspirations might be relevant to the to the um motivations of the characters in this scene um given the state uh, uh, and the reality of certain people in the public sphere. Anyway, that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> great, I think that's great. Um, yeah, I have another question, a final question, and then we can open it up to audience questions if that works for all of you. Um, so my final question is just, uh, what do you think the role of theater is in a time of crisis? I know you addressed a lot in your, uh, in the live stream about it, but just if you have any additional thoughts or even just more generally about theater, yeah, just what the role of theater is yeah. in a time of crisis, um, our theme for the summer. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to open this up to Julie and Olivia too, if you guys have any thoughts as well, because um, I, have, I have thought a lot about this specifically in regards to Shakespeare, um, but what is the role of it sounds like your question is what is the what is the role of live theater specifically? Um, yeah, I mean it could be live theater, or Shakespeare, yeah. or mm -hmm. just the arts, anything. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, and I, I kind of uh, talked a bit about this in the in the uh, performance as well. But um, I, the more I think about it, the more I look at the relevance of Shakespeare specifically, but also the questions that art forces us to ask about ourselves and the world we live in. Um, I think that would be my, I think going off of what I already talked about, I think that would be my biggest uh, kind of tagline is, is um, we have to be willing to 
accept the questions that art demands of us. Um, and whatever they may be. Um, and I think I, I remember a very long time ago, the, um, the great uh, professor, Jeff Miller, um, once saying in, in class or in some conversation somewhere that, you know, really good theater, really good art in, uh, in general, um, doesn't necessarily provide an answer, but it always has to ask a question. Um, and that's what I think good theater does. And I think the really good theater um, asks questions that are difficult to answer. Otherwise, I'm not sure what the point is. Um, uh, that's why I kind of, when I wrote my, um, going back to senior sem with Norm, when I wrote my um, uh, mission statement, um, I, t I thought a lot about what I wanted to seek through the art I made and also the art that I, um, uh, you know, ingested. Um, and I, I am a strong proponent, uh, a strong believer in art that um, challenges and disturbs. Uh, it is, it's kind of like, I, I don't know, Norm, if you coined this phrase, but um, I will always remember, you know, um, you shall, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you uncomfortable, right? Um, something along those lines. Uh, and that's, that's, honestly what I think good art should do. Art is not, its primary purpose I, I believe is not to comfort us or to coddle us or to soothe our own pre, um, preconceptions about the world, but the point is to challenge us and to hopefully urge us toward the betterment of ourselves. And ideally, once we can do that, the betterment of the world around us. Um, I, I don't know if I kind of got off topic of what you were, <laughs> um, of what you were asking, Ryan, but um, that's that's kind of my broad philosophy of what really good theater does and what it still can do, and that's why it's so important now in the world we live in. Um, and I, I think, you know, the world the world that we live in off obviously is in a is in a a difficult place, um, but we see through Shakespeare too that we, we have to remind ourselves too that through Shakespeare and reading Shakespeare and studying him uh, and works of his time and, and all art through all time has always been relevant because it's always been addressing the troubles of the time. And people have, you know, there, is, there have always been struggles, there have always been difficulties and that's not to invalidate the, the difficulties that are happening now, but um, that's the other important element to realize I think about good theater and good art is that it's, uh, it harkens us back to uh, the struggles of all humanity and not just our own narrow um, kind of scope of vision, I think, provides a greater sense of consciousness. Yeah, but I'm, I'll stop ranting for now. <laughs> That's great. Olivia or Julia, anything to add on? Yeah, I really like what you were saying too about how like it's like grounded in a specific thing um because it seems to me that the deeply specific is like the most universal and like when we we get to kind of play like this specific situation it allows you to like see how how personal it can be for you too and anybody kind of facing that situation and I I think just now too especially like it's vital because it helps us like understand and like make sense of what's happening to us like right now too and to just like when you're just watching it too like like you said just like ingesting art like it it can really help you to kind of understand like what's going on currently yeah I think also it's pretty amazing how we're able to do Shakespeare plays and like turn them into modern day scenarios. And, you know, we did that at, at Gordon with As You Like It. I think, where did we say it? it was in the, it was in Tennessee, right? In the, yeah. So I, don't, I just like always so cool to see how people are, making Shakespeare contemporary and how it's so relevant and people just understand exactly what's going on and just how that's a piece of history that will never die, a piece of literature or so, there's so many things like that that um, 
are just groundbreaking for any generation. But that's what I, I really appreciate about Shakespeare too. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think that covers it pretty much. Um, some great answers. And now we'll open it up for questions from the rest of the audience. If there's any questions either about the presentation um, that we just saw or just about theater at Gordon in general, um, all three of them were theater majors, Drew, Olivia, and Julia were all theater majors. So if there's anything specific you wanna know about their experience or uh, Drew's experience directing this piece, yeah, just let us know. I thought that um, there's two young men on the screen here, both of whom have played Orlando in different productions. So, you know, I, Drew, if we had more time, I would, I would argue with you about your interpretation of Orlando as, a, you know, this. I, I think probably you missed it, but we could have that conversation at another time. Sure, you know. it would take days. <laughs> it would, which yeah. would be so much fun, wouldn't it? It would. I oh, love more norm. <laughs> so fun. But it, okay, here, um, I had a question for uh, Olivia and Julia as, as well. Um, but I also, I'll comment on you to your other stuff, true, Drew. I, I'm not just giving you a hard time. There were some really beautiful, powerful things that you said. <laughs> um, really. A scene that I was surprising, I, more moved in different elements of it than I expected was Othello. I love, I love, love that play. And that's such a powerful scene. But I think it was also, the two of you served Amelia and Desdemona so well because you know each other so well too. It felt, I felt the history and trust between the two of you um, so that, when in the beginning of the scene, Amelia can notice that Desdemona is not doing well here. You, you know, the song, what's with the song? What's going on? And so starts talking about guys in a way that they wouldn't talk about in front of men, which I thought was great. It, you know, Lodovico is a proper man. He's handsome. You know, it, and then the, the fact that the two of you took the time to just sit with that joy between two women uh, and laugh about this guy and his nether lip. I thought, way to go, way to go. You just sat right with it and enjoyed it, which then earned from me um, the stuff that followed when you're talking about men, which still feels like any woman would be happy to be saying that at some point in their life anyway. Okay, men, what's the, do you think women can't feel that? We do, we do. And just building with it with each other. Um, so I guess my question is, all of that to ask a question. Is this a surprise? Um, playing it together, what, what elements of playing those characters and knowing the, um, that sense of crisis that they're in of those moments. Um, what did you find most relatable to your relationship as two women to each other and the opportunity to be able to say, men really don't get it a lot of the time. That's what was coming across to me more than I expected. So. It, did you, did you get a question in there at all? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, okay, see, right. I see both of you smiling, knowing that's a kind of a question from them. So, but it was beautiful too, by the way. It was, all the scenes were lovely, but lovely. So what do you think? I can start. Um, well, first, you know, that part when, yeah, we talk about Lodovico mm. and we're smiling. Drew really pulled that out of us where he was like, mm. okay, enjoy this moment, you know, before the singing stuff, like really like, ha ha ha. This is like a cute moment between the two of you. I think um, for me, we talked about this a lot, but just the idea that 
just me trying to go into the scene thinking about like this man that I love is just like he just you know he hit me and he's just so angry with me um going into the scene like trying to process that that was like my first initial Mm -hmm. um what was going on in my head but I think um if I'm understanding your question right like one of the things that one of the things that really stood out was the fact that I had this idea in my head about what marriage is supposed to be Mm -hmm. right and Amelia kind of, she's more experienced and she, she has some insight or she thinks she has some insight that, and she's telling me about it. And it's kind of really altering and confusing my views on, on what I think, what I think needs to be as a marriage. Right. Yeah. And just it being kind of unrealistic. I think that was probably the main thing. I just, my inner monologue was like, no, I just, I can't believe that this is just the way it has to work, mm-hmm. that this is the way women um, see yeah. being married, you know, as at this period in life. Right. It just, just so universal. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I had these expectations and it's just not that. Right. Right. So it was heartbreaking and funny rubbing up against each other, right? Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right, huh? And it was so cool because all the scenes, you know, either we're playing men or one of us is a man. Mm. But this scene, it was Mm. like both women. It was relatable. It was more relatable. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of more, more, um, not more fun, but more intimate with Julia, I guess. It did have that. I will say that I, I, um, almost didn't choose that. I, I, I think you, I told you guys, I almost didn't choose that scene. I almost went with um, the second main interaction between um, Angelo and Isabella. In that uh, I was wondering if you're going to choose measure for measure. Yeah, I, I, I was yeah. close, Norm. I was this close. And I, and I, at the end of the day, I was like, well, I have two female actresses and I, there's mm. something about that particular scene that seems very, it's, I mean, the whole play, that particular scene is so defined by gender role and sex. So You would have been tempted to play Angelo yourself and sell one of them, to take a rest in the scene. It would have been a so yeah. I, um, yeah. but I, but I discovered this scene in, in Othello and I was like, mm. this is a beautiful, relevant scene and I don't have any scenes yet with, you know, two ostensibly female characters, so. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. 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 This scene, it just felt so us. Like, very, yeah. very easy to relate to. Like, we've had conversations like this, like, right before rehearsal, you know? It's just like every time Olivia would say, Oh, these men, I'm like, Yeah. Like, we literally just had this conversation. And it, it, I just felt like I was talking to her. And I think something that was really easy to latch on to was kind of like the beginning of the scene too, where I'm just kind of comforting her because like, I know how to do that, like specifically with like you, Olivia. And so like kind of translating that into like how Amelia would do it to Desdemona, like, yeah, it was just easier to kind of latch onto like that idea of like comforting your friend when like her world is just like turned upside down because like everything you thought about love or like what a specific relationship was going to be, like it's not that anymore. And so like, just like sitting with your friend like through that change is like very easy to latch on to. Right. (sighs) Hmm. And that language, you know, all those one syllable words that Amelia has later, I think they are, I think she does, boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Are there any other questions, questions from anybody? Yes, yeah, Sarah, I see a hand. Hi. So this is a bit of a confusing question, so bear with me here. I noticed in lots of the pieces that you chose, these Shakespearean pieces, you really leaned into this concept of the tragedy. And I noticed through a lot of Shakespeare's works, he chooses to acknowledge the tragedies and the crises that are at hand. And I think that is a wonderful thing, and I think that can be very healing for people. And I think that's a really interesting thing to focus on, the question of what are we going to do with these crises. But something that I've been noticing through the pandemic specifically, as I've seen 
my lower classmen friends handling the situation, how I've seen directors at my, my high school handling the situation, we've been leaning into this concept of the comedy as well. Something I've noticed throughout theater history, like for example, Rodgers and Hammerstein, focusing on like romanticism and escapism from the tragedies at hand. In your opinion, what role does the comedy have in what is at hand right now? Because from what my school has done in the past is, um, let me just think of an example. On the weekend that our high school musical was supposed to happen and it got canceled because of all that's going on, we decided to instead as an online watch group, watch another play that we had done as a group and laugh together. And while it wasn't really focusing on the crisis at hand and we weren't discussing the crisis and we weren't thinking about ways that we can be better, we took a moment to be human and laugh and pretend for a second that the world kind of wasn't falling apart. So in your opinion, and I also want to ask this to Julia and Olivia, what role does comedy and joy and laughter play in all of this? Uh, no role at all. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Um, no, I, I, I uh, there is, there's so much I, I, I could say, and we don't have time for all of it, but um, I think just my, my broad thoughts are, um, I will, you know, preface this by saying that I, I am somebody who, uh, is working on on getting better at this, at um, recognizing the value that uh, comedy can have. I, 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 for a long time, I was not, um, I, I was not very much of a believer in escapism. Um, but what I think is interesting, and I think this is something that you were alluding to, to Sarah, is that there is astoundingly a lot of the art and the theater and the film and all of that that's being made now is decidedly on the more escapist, uh, you know, um, lighthearted side. I think we see a lot of that being made now. Um, and I don't think that's any coincidence. I, I think that um, at the end of the day, there is a balance and uh, we need to be able to recognize the value too that um, that joy has in uh, in art as a form of redemption, um, and I think that's for me. There, I think how should I say this? I think for me, there's a difference between um, finding joy through art versus finding um, entertainment and 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 kind of light uh, light entertainment. Um, I think what's good about Shakespeare's comedy specifically is that they, in the classical sense, um, and in, in, in most Western literature, um, tragedy and comedy are not necessarily defined by sad things and happy things, but, and, or funny things, but the, the difference largely is in the ending. Um, the, the primary kind of, uh, what, what really defines a comedy, um, I, talked a little bit about this in, in the, uh, during the performance, but um, what makes As You Like It or Much Ado a real comedy is, yes, I mean, you know, funny things happen and it is, it is ultimately a lighthearted piece, but there's a very real, there's still, there's still a very real possibility that um, things are not going to turn out well. Um, and, uh, you know, th you know, Claudio and Hero don't, uh, mend the damage that has been done. You know, or, you know, Rosalind or, or um, Orlando ends up falling out of love with Rosalind and all is lost in that department. Jayquees, who I didn't even get to talk about, maybe never finds any sort of um, uh, redemption or hope in the world, but they do at the end. Um, there is some degree of um, restoration or, or the beginning of restoration and hope towards a better end. Um, and that, I think, the laugh, the kind of laughter that comes out of that is more of the laughter of joy than the laughter of um, entertainment. I, I don't, I, there's more I could say about this, but it's, I don't know if I'm kind of making sense here. <laughs> um, but I, I, 
it's not that I think there's anything wrong with um, with allowing ourselves to be entertained. Um, I think there's great value to it, but I think that it's important that those things are not what we choose to um, consume ourselves with, because uh, and you know there's more I could say about that, but um, I should let Julia and Olivia talk as well. Uh, thanks for the question, Sarah. I really liked when you were talking about how you were like just like sitting with your students and just like laughing and just like pretending that like everything was okay, because I remember as like we were rehearsing this, Drew was saying like. You know, like, honestly, there's probably some moments in here, like in the tragic scenes, it's like, there's some moments in here that you're probably, you might be laughing. Like, you might be saying something so horrible, but you're saying it through a smile or through a laugh, and it's still going to be just as true, if not more. I, I think, I think you're so right, like, Sarah, like, I think, you know, even if it is like a tragic scene or play or whatever, like, you're going to find that joy in there. And I think the joy that is kind of expressed on stage like the audience will kind of like feel that too and like oh like yeah it's so relatable and i think laughter is so important i think that when we are having like horrible times like laughter is the thing that saves us um and the joy that we find like amidst whatever the circumstances are that's what like where the redemption is yeah yeah and i think it's such a blessing and so great that we have both options the comedy and the tragedy in theater and I'm really different from Drew because I I prefer the comedy things but I also have developed a newfound love for all the you know the tragedy and and seriousness of situations too um but like Drew was saying it's so important like especially during this time to just be able to laugh and and you know have things like SNL and Jimmy Fallon too where you're talking about hard things but you know they're um kind of being silly about it but also it's okay to be sad too sad sometimes so yeah I guess I just like that we have both that's good I think at the end of the day I sorry we probably we're out of time aren't we we have to stop no, it's all right. Well, yeah, we'll start to wrap up in a few minutes. But yeah, any final uh, thoughts? Or if anyone has a final quick question, we can definitely get to it. We'll probably wrap up in about five minutes here. Can I ask a quick one? Yeah. Maybe it's a quick one. Um, so my question is about making theater during a pandemic. Um, you know, it, it's all about embodied presence, that this kind of art making. And so the whole fact that we cannot be with each other physically in a space, right? I mean, it's just like the end of theater, or at least it's on pause for during this time. And so when I was watching uh, the performances, I was really struck by what most of us would assume is a, is a barrier or a challenge to theater making. And that is what we're all doing right here, right? So this kind of a Zoom or some kind of digital mediated presence. And yet, and this is where I'd like maybe Olivia and Julie, or even Drew as the director for this, if you would want to comment, um, what would you say would be some of the opportunities maybe that you discovered by um, doing your scenes through this medium? Because for me as an audience member, all of a sudden, and I've never seen Shakespeare perform this way, but I, I saw some of these texts that I've heard in some cases, you know, many times before, but in a way that um, almost made it more intimate. So it almost was like I was eavesdropping on like a video chat, um, like notions of conspiracy or, or um, love, all of these things for me as an audience member, all of a sudden it, it opened up the text for me in new ways. So I don't know, as, as, as actors, as a director, um, in what ways did you see having to do it through this medium more as, a, as an opportunity than a challenge? Did you mm -hmm. see it that way? Mm -hmm. I think what you're talking about, how it seems more intimate and like you're kind of eavesdropping on a situation, I, I feel that exact same way. It's like you're on a FaceTime call or you're watching a FaceTime call between two people. Um, it was so, when you were saying this, it, it reminded me of um, in January, Julie and I were talking and she was showing me on Instagram that um, 
there was like, do you remember this, Juliet? There was like this Instagram. Oh, yeah. Can you explain it? Oh, or it was so cool. It was like basically like what we were doing today. Like there was this woman, I don't remember her name. There were these two women and they basically created like this web series, but they just like, they like blurred the lines of like reality and like film or theater or whatever and they were on like a FaceTime call and it would be posted on Instagram like each day and it was just this call of them talking and just they were like um in love or something and they were going through like troubles and you just felt like you were watching you know their correspondence because they were like far away and they like couldn't see each other um so yeah it was basically that just like eavesdropping on a FaceTime call and this was before the pandemic too yes too. yeah so we're doing this yeah, this was during, yeah, when we were in Titanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was so interesting, too, because when we were rehearsing, uh, it was kind of like, okay, where are we supposed to look? Like, where's our focal point? Because we were having to, you know, read it. We had some little lines memorized, but, you know, the bulk of it wasn't memorized. And so I think Drew said this, that, you know, we would just, like, look into the webcam to make it seem, you know, more intimate. So I guess just, like, yeah finding focal points and it's kind of it's kind of fun to see like wow how can we um how can we um use this kind of challenge to um and like make it like how are we challenged to make this seem more real you know because it seems like an obstacle and it seems kind of weird and you know how would we do that and I think too like since it was like a reading as opposed to like when you know you do a scene and you're able to just kind of like focus on the person and not have any distractions I think you know a reading in person that's always cha more challenging for me because I have to like look down and up but at least on a screen you, you just kind of have to look to the side a little I mean just like a logistical thing but it it honestly made the process like easier at least for me in terms of like staying engaged and not you know, getting distracted by looking down. Um, it was just like kind of a, a closer thing. Um, yeah. And it makes it more accessible too for other people. So yeah. And yeah, like not something. seeing your whole body too, that, that kind of, it kind of frees you up sometimes too, because all you have to really, you know, focus on is what's, what's happening with your face. And it's so close. So it doesn't have to be like something big. Like it's just like, you said intimate like it's just a little bit more like very grounded in reality because it's just so close mm -hmm. i think you two are much more optimistic than i am <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I i i mean just from an actor's perspective i i the 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 first things i notice are the things that i can't do that i would be able to um and uh but actually hearing julia and olivia um talk about it is actually helpful to me to think, wow, I guess, yeah, 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 well, I guess there are some advantages that I hadn't considered. Um, but I do think about, there's a, for me, there's, I think the biggest thing is that there is a certain immediacy to what, what theater is, is meant, meant to be in my own mind, um, that is sharing a physical space with another actor. Um, and w one of the most frustrating technical technical difficulties that you run into on Zoom is um, uh, overlap and uh, knowing how to exactly nail. Okay, well, if we want um, if we want this to be a you know say a, a shared verse line or something, where one person is picking up the rest of the line from another person and they're almost talking on top of each other, um, we have to time it so you know, one actor knows when to start speaking exactly um, uh, so that it sounds like a shared verse line to the audience member. Um, and there's no way for Julia or Olivia to really know that uh, except by what I can see and hear. Um, so there, so things like that are easier to do uh, in person. Um, so I miss the immediacy, but it's like Julie and Olivia say, there, there are a lot of, there's a certain intimacy that you don't get um, necessarily if you're in a you know, big theater or something of hundreds of people. Um, there, it, it does in some ways create something of a more personalized experience perhaps for the audience member. Um, that is not to say though that I 
prefer this medium. <laughs> um, but I suppose it could be worse. And those are my, you know, triumphal, uh, glorious thoughts to close with. <laughs> Well, th thanks to the three of you. It was very, very lovely. And it was just, it, for me, it opened up the text to just a new way to have you say it right to me, it felt like. That it was having you look at me as opposed to each other. It was, so I'll be thinking about that for a bit. It was very nicely done. Thank you for that. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you all. Well, I think we'll start to wrap up here. Um, Drew, I don't know if you have any just final, final words, final thoughts. Um, no, I think the only thing I would say is um, to all those here and to all those watching at home, uh, whenever you might be watching this, um, please, please, please do everything you can to support the arts. <laughs> um, because uh, without them, this would be a much uh, darker world. And I would implore you not to forget when you were enjoying your films, your theater, your music, um, paintings whatever it may be that there are people behind that that made it um and they are sadly significantly undervalued um and often underpaid but that's another matter um but yeah i think that would be my only exhortation but um besides that uh, yeah thank you to everybody uh, this is a great great joy to do and uh quite a quite a um quite an outlet i think very necessary for a lot of us Great, perfect. Well, thank, thank you and thank you, Olivia and Julia, for also being a part of this. Um, and thanks to everyone in our audience tonight and everyone who watched the live stream earlier. Uh, just a reminder that next week we'll be back uh, same, same day, Wednesday at 6 p.m. with Joe Bandy and his presentation on documentaries, TikTok, and the power of perspective. And thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again real soon. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>